This week we're in Zechariah chapter 2 verse 6 to chapter 4 verse 10. Now last week, the second week, uh, we see Zechariah, he's, uh, he was prophesying. Oh, I forgot something. No. He's prophesying to exiles from Babylon. Uh, they've come back into the land. Um, the spiritual conditions were, were pretty poor. Um, and, uh, you know, Jehovah, he said, Jehovah said that he was very displeased. He was so displeased with their fathers. And uh, one of the reasons why they were in the, in the pickle that they were in was because of the fact that they were, they turned their back on God. And he says to them, he says, return to me and, uh, and I'll return to you. Uh, that's what God is saying to the people. So this, we know that Zechariah is, uh, is about how Israel are going to live during the times of the Gentiles. Remember, we spoke about uh, Daniel was the one who prophesied about the times of the Gentiles. But Zechariah actually tells us now, he's going to tell us in his book, how the Jews, how Israel, how the Jews will live during the time of the Gentiles. Uh, right. So uh, the, the Jews, they rejected God's prophets. Uh, all the prophets who were prophesying to them saying, you know, turn back to God, turn back to God. They rejected, rejected God. And so that led to the state that they found themselves in, in that 70 year captivity. Now, Zechariah has a series of visions. He has eight visions. Uh, last week, we looked at the first vision. And the first vision was that God has a plan for Israel. We have, uh, we had the four horses. We had the angel of Jehovah. He was in the midst of those that he was in the midst of that. And uh, uh, what we see is that uh, in that first vision that there is a promise of a, of a future blessing. Uh, and with those four horsemen, we see three of them were sent to and fro across the earth. Uh, and they said, hey, earth's quiet. Fantastic. No, 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 it wasn't fantastic at all because it meant that God's plan for Israel wasn't moving along. So, they said nothing's happening regarding uh, God's plan for Israel. Uh, we see also that uh, in one of the, uh, the, the, the words of comfort uh, for, for, uh, for, for the Jews, he said, listen, he, God says, there will be mercy for Zion. The temple will be rebuilt because that's what they were back in the land doing. They were going to try and rebuild the temple. And Jerusalem is going to be magnificent in the future. Second vision we had were four horns. Uh, four horns. What are the horns? Horns are powers. They're, they're, they're powers. So we had these four horns were the ones that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. What are the four horns? Four horns were the four Gentile empires that, that, that scattered, dispersed Israel. Um, and that was the, uh, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Hellenistic, and then the Imperial Empire of, started off with Rome. Um, in those four empires or, or four horns, we then see that there are four smiths, or tr tradesmen, you know, artisans, smiths. Uh, and those four, those four smiths were sent to punish the four horns. Now, four smiths, what are they? Well, they're the four kings, and uh, the first king in those four horns was Cyrus. Uh, then we had Alexander the Great, uh, who was from the Hellenistic Empire. Cyrus was from the Medo-Persian Empire. He was a Persian. Uh, then we had Pompey. He was uh, from the Roman Empire when, it, when this empire of imperialism first started off. It was, it was the empire of Rome. And then the, the fourth one, the fourth smith that we have is Messiah himself. So that's the four smiths who will come and punish the four horns. The third vision we have Jerusalem will be with a man with a measuring line uh, and Jerusalem will be the capital of the messianic kingdom uh, in the millennial earth. That's where her, her pride of place will be. And so we had this man with the measuring line. And why was he measuring it? Because, well, you know, Jerusalem is destined to be built up and she will be the head of the world. That's where all the nations will go, to Jerusalem. So that brings us today to where we are now. 
and we see the explanation of what we've just seen in that third vision. And, and we see this in verses uh, 6 to 13 of chapter 2. Uh, now, the vision itself ended back there in chapter 2, verse 5. And what we have in, the, in 6 to 13 is now explaining what we saw in, in, in that previous, the previous verses. In verses 6 to 7, what we start off with, there is a call to leave Babylon. It starts out by saying, ho, ho, flee from the land of the north. Uh, this isn't Santa Claus coming from the north. Uh, ho, 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 ho. Actually, ho translates a, a Hebrew word that elsewhere often means woe, woe, woe. Uh, and we see this in Habakkuk 2. He uses it quite a lot there. So, Zechariah, he's now dealing with the, the land of the north, right? The land of the north. Now, from Israel's perspective, that would be Babylon, okay? It's called the land of the north. Why? Because invading armies and trading caravans uh, from, the, from the land, from that land, from, from Babylon to Jerusalem, came around the route up the north through the Fertile Crescent and entered Palestine from the north. So, that's who we're, we're referring to here. This, in this instance, the land from the north is, is Babylon. Now, there will be Jews in Babylon in the tribulation period because we saw that in Revelation 18. Uh, because in Revelation 18, it calls them to come out of Babylon. Now, in that passage in Revelation 18, as well as here, there is a call for those Jews to leave Babylon. Remember, uh, this is this Zechariah is here. Zechariah is the post-exile prophet to the people, uh, and uh, in all, uh, those who left Babylon and came back were about forty-nine thousand people. That, that's all. Um, the majority stayed on in Babylon, so there's a call for them to leave Babylon, come back into the land. And he points out that uh, here he points out, uh, God says, he said, I have spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven. So it was God who had scattered them, uh, and part of that scattering was into Babylon. Now, historically, uh, Babylon did fall two years after this prophecy was given. But the final fulfillment will be in the last days last days, when God will regather the Jews from their worldwide dispersion. So that's, this, that's, that's the final fulfillment, where God will regather them from all around the world in back into the land. Now, but now, for now, Ze uh, Zechariah is saying to them, uh, God is saying to them, they must leave Babylon. Ho, Zion, escape you that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. And we see here the use of the singular daughter here means it's the population of Babylon. And those Jews who didn't return were content to dwell or to live amongst the Babylonians. They were happy there. They'd made their life there and uh, they were very prosperous there. So they were happy to stay on there. But the point here uh, is in light of chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 that teaches that, that Israel is going to be restored the Jews of Babylon should return. Now, there's an immediate application to the Jews still living in Babylon who had not yet returned. Uh, and that is, they need to get out. Why? Because the next smith, who is Cyrus of the Medo-Persian horn, he's coming. So what, uh, what uh, the, the warning to them is, get out of Babylon because the next the next Gentile empire, the next power is on the way. And that was the Medo-Persians. And Cyrus, the king of the Persians, he was heading to Babylon. So what he's saying is, get out of Babylon. So that's the immediate context. But the, the in this context where you know, Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt and magnificent, the primary thrust of the text is that, that in the Babylon of the future, Jews are called upon to return. Why? Because God is about to make Jerusalem, instead of Babylon, the center of the earth. 
it will be the the primo city in the world. Now, in verses eight to nine of chapter two, he deals with the coming of the Messiah. Um, and yeah, we need to we need to uh, we need to have a have a look at this because we need to have a look who the speakers are. Uh, the, the, the two speakers here. Now, um, first up here, uh, the, the speaker here he, he he identifies himself as Jehovah, for thus says Jehovah of hosts. Then he says, after glory. Has he sent me onto the nations or Gentiles, which plundered you? So, on account of God's glory, he sends the Messiah. And in keeping with the motif of the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 3, I will curse them that curse you, the Messiah is sent to punish the nations for mistreating the Jews. Uh, remember uh, when we looked when we covered last week uh, god was displeased with the gentile nations because they went beyond what he wanted in, in the way that they treated the jews so what we see here is that this here must refer to the second coming and uh, not the first because when messiah came the first time did he come to to bring judgment no he came to to seek uh, and save the lost sheep of the house of israel that was at his first coming not to bring judgment uh, the second coming is to bring judgment he comes as a king in preparation to judge now the reason that these gentiles must be punished is because he that touches israel touches the apple of his eye now the apple of the eye uh, as the israel motif comes out of deuteronomy 32 verse 10. the apple of the eye is the pupil of the eye uh, and in this case it's god's eye uh, figuratively it's god's eye so if someone tries to touch your eye what are you going to do you, you're you bang him, bang him away. That's the first reaction is to slap him away. That's how God feels when a Gentile nation comes against Israel. Um, and at this point in time, there'd be a, there are a lot of Gentile nations were coming against Israel. So there'd be a lot of slapping around. So what we see here is that it is as if uh, they have poked their finger into the pupil of God's eye, and God is going to use the Messiah in the future to slap them down. So the judgment is, I will shake my hand over them. So as he slaps them away, his hand will shake over them in judgment. And they shall be a spoil to those that served them. The ones that serve them, especially in, in this context where uh, Zechariah is today, is referring to the Jews who were forced to be servants of the Gentiles. Now, in the future, these nations are going to become a spoil to Israel. And at that point, he says, you shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me. So when this comes to pass, they will know that it was God who had sent the Messiah. We should notice here that there are two different individuals named Jehovah in this passage. In verse 8, we noted that the speaker is Jehovah. It says, thus says Jehovah of hosts. But in verse 9, it is Jehovah who sends the speaker. Jehovah of hosts has sent me. So this is one of the, those Old Testament uh, verses which shows a, 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 a plurality in the Godhead. Jehovah is a speaker, yet Jehovah sends the speaker. Now the vision, this third vision, ends in verses 10 to 13. And it ends here with God inhabiting Jerusalem. And in verses 10 to 11, his point here is that Jehovah will indwell or will, will dwell in Jerusalem. Now in verse 12, Israel is to rejoice because God will dwell in her midst. 
He says to the city, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. This is the nation of Israel. Sing and rejoice. Why? For lo, I come. And this is a reference to the second coming because it is after the results of verses 8 and 9. And what does he say? He says, and I will dwell in the midst of you. That's the result of the second coming. Messiah will physically, visibly, literally dwell in the midst of Jerusalem in Israel. Then in verse 11, he points out here that many Gentiles will also come. Many nations shall join themselves to Jehovah in that day. That day is a specific day. That day is a shortened form of the day of the Lord. It's a specific day in the future. Now, during the tribulation, many Gentiles will be saved, as we saw when we did the Revelation study. Uh, so many Gentiles will be saved in that period of time. And it, and it says, and God goes on to say here, and they shall be my people. So as well as Israel, these saved Gentiles will also be God's people. Now, these saved Gentiles are the same as the sheep Gentiles of Matthew 25, 31 to 46. The sheep Gentiles are those who have placed their faith in Messiah Jesus. The goat Gentiles were those who rejected him. Um, if, if you were to look at uh, Isaiah 2, uh, verses 2 to 3, it's a little verse from Isaiah. Isaiah 2, 2 to 3 says, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mount of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. So uh, Isaiah has really prophesied that in the future, the Gentile nations are going to come to the mount of the Lord, which is Jerusalem. Now, in the second part of verse 11, he now points out here that the Messiah is dwelling in Israel's midst. And that will be the evidence that God did send him, right? He says, I will dwell in the midst of you, repeating the promise that he will live within Jerusalem. That means you shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you. Here again, two Jehovahs are found in this passage, showing a, a, again a sense of plurality within the Godhead. Um, if we... If we look at verse 11, it says, Many nations shall join themselves to Jehovah in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of you, and you shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me. So you, you can see the, the two Jehovahs in that passage. Now, in verse 12, he says here that not only will he dwell in Jerusalem, but he will inherit Judah. Jehovah shall inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land. The Lord's portion is the people. And we find that from Deuteronomy 32, verse 9. So Israel is God's inheritance. God's portion and his portion will be found in the Holy Land in the Messianic Kingdom. Uh, you know, the, the term holy land that we see here, uh, it refers to Israel. This is the only place in the whole of the Bible where it's actually called the holy land. Nowhere else. Uh, it, it's frequently used to describe Israel, uh, but in the Hebrew Bible, it's uh, usually referred to as Eretz Israel. Uh, but only in this one case is it called the holy land. He now points out that he will yet choose Jerusalem as a center. So in light of what God is going to do for the city of Jerusalem, there is a call to the earth for silence. In verse 13, it says, be silent all flesh before Jehovah. Why? Well, 
for he hath waked up out of his holy habitation. So in this in this final verse of a final vision, uh, final verse of this vision in in, uh, in verse thirteen, the picture here depicts God as a lion who's about to come out of his place to fulfill the promises he he has made. <clears throat> now we come to the <clears throat> the fourth vision, and we see this in. Um, just hang on a sec. We just flip these folk in, and we see this in uh, chapter three, verses one to ten. Okay. The point now of this vision is that God will cleanse Israel. Why? So that the people can fulfill their original function by becoming a nation of priests. Uh, they're a holy nation. Uh, they are holy unto God. They're a nation of priests unto God. Uh, and we can summarize this vision in two, two main points here. First of all, before the blessings of the first three visions can come to pass for Israel, uh, the nation must undergo a, a, a spiritual transformation. The regeneration of Israel is the prerequisite for their final restoration. Can't be, can't be restored if they continue to reject Messiah. Second, uh, this vision here is for the purpose of restoring <coughs> the people's confidence in the priesthood. Why? Because remember, it was the priesthood that led them astray. Uh, it was the priesthood uh, which they may have, uh, the, the confidence they would have lost in the priesthood because of the corruption which characterized the priesthood before the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. The priesthood were corrupt. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in that Ezekiel study that we did, you, you know, they were, the priesthood were, were, were just so corrupt. And so the people need to have their confidence in the priesthood restored. And so this, uh, this, is, this vision here is for the purpose of doing that. And here we're going to come to what uh, looks like a court case. And we see this in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Now, in, the, in these uh, first five verses here, what do we have? We have here a vision uh, of a court case. Uh, verse 1 describes the situation. The verse begins with, and he showed me. Uh, so he's pointing out here that we have a new vision. And in this vision, Zechariah saw Joshua the high priest standing. Now, this is the same Joshua we find in the book of Haggai. He was the high priest. And in this vision, he represents Israel. Now, this, this is not the Joshua who led them into the promised land, all right? Uh, uh, this is Joshua, the high priest. He's standing here. He's standing in for Israel. He is the defendant in this court case. So he, he's representing Israel here. He not only symbolizes Israel, but he also symbolizes and represents the priesthood. Why? Because he was the high priest uh, at that time. Uh, and we can see that from Ezra uh, 4.3, Ezra 5.2, Haggai 1.1, 1, 1, uh, Verse 12, 2, 2, and we see, we're going to see him in Zechariah 6 uh, before too long. So this Joshua of that day, he's representing Israel and the priesthood. Now, we're told here that he's standing in a court of law. He's ready to be judged one way or the other. Now, if Joshua is condemned, so is Israel, because he's representing Israel. But if Joshua is declared innocent and is cleansed, then so too is Israel. Now, besides Joshua, Zechariah now, he, he sees Joshua. Besides Joshua, he sees Joshua is before the angel of Jehovah. And in this vision, and the angel of Jehovah in this vision, he's serving as the judge. But as well as Joshua... And Jehovah, we also see Satan is standing at his right hand. Uh, remember, Satan at this point, he, he still has access to heaven. 
Uh, and just as he used that axis in heaven in the book of Job uh, to accuse Job, uh, so here, here in this court case, in this court scene, Satan is Joshua's adversary. He accuses the saints in Revelation 12, 10, and in Zechariah 3, 1, he uses his access into heaven for the purpose of accusing Israel before God. And in this vision, he's serving as the prosecuting attorney. So we have uh, Joshua, who is the defendant. We have the prosecuting attorney, who is Satan. And we have the judge, who is the angel of Jehovah. Now, in verse 2 of chapter 3, we have the rebuking of Satan. And Jehovah said unto Satan. Uh, so the devil here is addressed directly in this passage, and he receives a strong rebuke from God. Jehovah rebuke you, O Satan. Yea, Jehovah that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. And in Hebrew, uh, the rebuke carries through to the point of suppression and annihilation of the accusation. It just, it just destroys it completely. So the basis for the rebuke here is God will yet choose Jerusalem. In other words, Satan is now being rebuked because his accusation, sorry, Satan is not rebuked because his accusations are not true, because they are true. His accusations are probably true when they were made against Israel. Uh, he's not being rebuked because Israel is righteous. Israel is not a righteous nation. The reason Satan is being rebuked is because of God's choice. Because of God's unchanging love and his choice of the Jews as his chosen people, God intends to save Israel as we see from his question here. Is this not a brand plucked out of the fire? This and this, what's a brand? It's just a, it's a piece of wood uh, that's been thrown into the fire, but before it's burnt up, it's plucked out of the fire. So it, it is burning, but it is grabbed out of the fire because you know what? I can still have, I still have a use for this uh, piece of burning wood here. Uh, it, it's like the Lord rescued this man as someone snatches a stick out of a fire. That's, that's what he's doing. So, so this here, it's a symbol which is used, which we see in Amos 4.11, Amos 4.11. So because God intends to save Israel and choose Israel, Satan, Satan's accusations are now rebuked. He says, I want to have a bar of that. Um, okay. Then we see in verse 3. We're given a description here of the state of Joshua. So remember, Joshua is in the courtroom here. Uh, it says Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Now, those filthy garments are describing Israel's state at that time. It's showing here that Satan's accusations were true. In English, they're called filthy garments. Uh, but the Hebrew is much stronger. It, it refers to filth of the most loathsome character of the kind described in Isaiah 64, 6. It, it, it roughly, it means that there was human excrement on his garments. So not only was he dirty looking, but he probably smelled bad as well. And this would have rendered him uh, ceremonially unclean to carry out the duties of the high priest. Now, again, here he points out uh, that Joshua was standing before the angel of Jehovah. He was standing in a court of law, but he is not going to be condemned. In fact, he was declared innocent, not because he was actually innocent, but because Messiah would take the guilt upon himself. So in verse 4, we have the changing of his garments. So the judge gave an order. He answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying. So we have the command here, and it's given to the other angels to take 
the filthy garments from off him. The removal of filthy garments symbolizes the forgiveness of sins here, as it does in Isaiah 61.10, where it, uh, it speaks about being clothed with the garments of salvation. Remember, we have been clothed with the garments of salvation. We have had our garments washed in the blood of the Lamb. So the judge's order here is to remove Joshua's filthy garments. And then we get the judge's verdict. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from you. So clearly what we're seeing here is that Joshua and Israel, who he represents, they definitely had iniquity. So Satan had every right to accuse them of their iniquity. They, so they had that. But God causes it to pass away. Now, pass away. Does he mean he just doesn't worry about it? No. He goes on to say, I will clothe you with rich apparel. So in place of the filthy garments which represent Israel's sins, he will now be clothed in the garments of salvation. And this salvation comes through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who is the angel of Jehovah, the judge here. Now, at this point, Zechariah speaks up and he says, this is Zechariah now speaking up. He said, hey, hang on, you've just, you've just given them new clothes. Hey, let's set a clean mitre upon his head. So the, what's the mitre? Well, the mitre is the priestly hat. And on the front of it was a little golden plate on the front of the turban, which had written on it in Hebrew, holiness unto Jehovah. And so this is pointing out that as far as God is concerned, and in spite of the sins of the priesthood previously, those sins had been cleansed. And the people should have their confidence now restored in the priesthood once again. So what God will do for the priesthood, he will someday do for all Israel. Now, in response to all of this, what do they do? They set a clean mitre upon his head and they clothe him with garments. So these are clean garments. No, no, no more filth of sin on them. They're now clean garments. They're probably, uh, they're, they're, they were probably the actual priestly robes that were being now placed upon him. And we see the end of it in verse 5, where it says, and the angel of Jehovah was standing by. What does that mean? It means that he was not saying anything now. He was standing by watching this take place. Why? Because he was approving of these actions. He was approving of them putting on the clean mitre on his head, as, as Zechariah had suggested. And uh, so the Messiah or, or the angel of Jehovah was here authenticating and approving the priesthood. Now in verses, now verse one to five, we had the court case. Now in verses six to 10, we hear the message uh, to Joshua, the high priest. He's gonna encourage Joshua. In the second part here, uh, uh, Zechariah's fourth vision, we have, now have a personal message to Joshua. In verse six, it's strongly stated here. It says, and the angel of Jehovah protested unto Joshua. Uh, the Hebrew word for protested here means that, that what he had to say was emphatically stated. And in verse seven, we see uh, that Joshua's duties are twofold. It says, first of all, he says, walk in my ways. What ways? God's ways. This refers to his personal spiritual walk. He's supposed to walk in God's ways. And in this case, he was supposed to walk in accordance with the Mosaic law. Second, keep my charge. And this has to do with his official priest, high priestly duties. And if he will do this, in the second part of verse 7, God spells out the reward he will have. And it includes three things. First of all, he says, you shall judge my house. Now, God's house is a temple. So this means that Joshua would be given various temple duties. And this would include uh, determining, you know, what's, uh, what's clean and unclean, what's kosher, what's not kosher, uh, 
And so that's part of his duties. And second, it says, you will keep my courts. Uh, this means he would have control over who would, be, uh, who would be allowed to enter and who would be kept out of the temple compound, being the high priest. And third, I will give you a place of access among these that stand by. Now, these that stand by, remember Joshua is there in, in his courtroom session. So these that stand by are the angels. So they're, they're the ones who, who, who put the new clothes in him. And so he would have free access here to the angelic courts, which was mentioned in, in, uh, back in uh, verse 4. There were those who stood by. Now, having said what Joshua's duties are, and what his rewards will be if he fulfills them. In verse 8, God then declares that the priests are a sign. Now, hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your fellows that sit before you. So this is the high priest, and this is the, the common priest who served him. Uh, they're the ones who are being spoken to here. For they, uh, that Mr. Priesthood, are a sign and the specific point of this sign is that God will bring forth my servant the branch my servant the branch now the branch what's the branch in the old testament we have the the branch doctrine uh, now now uh, it's not the second who speaks about it other other of the prophets speak about it a uh, bit of a bit of a summary um, here, there are four things concerning the branch. First of all, uh, the branch is a servant. And this is what we're just seeing here in verse 8 of chapter 3 of Zechariah. He's a servant. Uh, and guess what? You know, in the Gospels, that's the theme of the Gospel of Mark. Jesus, the Messiah, the servant of Jehovah. Second, the branch is a man. Uh, because later on, we're going to see in uh, Zechariah 6, verse 12, Zechariah will again uh, discuss the Messiah as the branch. But in that passage, the branch is a man. That's the theme of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of Man. That was emphasizing the humanity of Jesus. Now, third, the branch is a king. And this we see in Isaiah 11, verse 1. And we see it in, in uh, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, and Jeremiah 33, verse 15. This happens to be Matthew's theme, Jesus the Messiah, the King of the Jews. And then fourth, the branch is God. This is brought out in Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2, and also in Jeremiah 23, verses 5 to 6, or Jeremiah 23, verse uh, yeah, 5 to 6, and Jeremiah 33, verses 15 to 16. This is John's theme. John the Apostle's theme is Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. And John was emphasizing the deity of the Messiah. So this is the, this is the branch doctrine that we see from the Old Testament prophets. Uh, and we see it uh, in the Gospels, in each of the, the themes of each of those Gospel writers. So what we see here is we have these four facets of the branch doctrine in the Old Testament, and each gospel writer develops one of these four facets. Now, in Zechariah 3, verse 9, we also learn that the branch is a stone. Behold, this is verse 9 of, of Zechariah 3, Behold, the stone that I have set before Joshua, now, whenever the word stone is used symbolically, it is always a symbol for the Messiah. Uh, three examples from, uh, from, from, there's lots of them, but three examples from many would be Isaiah 28, verse 16, where we find that he is a foundation stone. Uh, Psalm 118, verse 22, he's the stone the, the builders rejected. Uh, Daniel 2, verse 35 he, it's the stone that smote the image. So then, uh, then he goes on to say here, then he says, upon one stone are seven eyes. 
So God is pointing out here that there's only one stone here, not many stones, not seven stones, there's one stone, but this one stone represents the Messiah. And this one stone has seven eyes, which emphasize that he is the all-seeing Messiah. He, he has the divine characteristics of omniscience and omnipresence. And, and we look in, we, if you go into Revelation 5, verse 6, uh, you will see he, here he speaking about the seven eyes. Then he goes on to say, I will engrave the graving thereof. And the point is here is that the identification of the name of the Messiah will be made on the stone. So this stone is the Messiah, Messianic person. In the third part of verse 9, he says, Then I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. One day. The entire sins of Israel will be gone. Taken away. He's referring to that land. That land, it's a specific land. It's the holy land that was mentioned back in chapter 2, verse 12. That land, that land, Israel. Um, and this deals here with the fact that uh, of the, the national regeneration of Israel will, uh, that will occur in just one day. And when they believe in the Messiah, just prior to the second coming. And this is also told to us in Isaiah 66, verse 8. Okay. Now, finally, we see the vision ends in verse 10 with the millennium. Uh, and, and here we get a bit of a summary scene. In that day, in that particular day, says Jehovah of hosts, shall you invite every man his neighbor onto the vine and onto the fig tree? Well, at least we know in the kingdom there's going to be vines and fig trees. Uh, uh, this motif here of sitting under a vine and under a fig tree is used as a symbol of security and prosperity, especially in the millennial kingdom. Uh, uh, we, we, we see it used that way in 1 Kings 4, verse 25, Isaiah uh, 36, verse 16, and in Micah 4, 4. Oops, oops, wrong one. Now we have the third vision. And we see this in, in chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. Oh, sorry, third, did I say third? No, this is the, the fifth vision, sorry. The fifth vision. Um, behind myself. Now the main point of the fifth vision here is that through the work of the Holy Spirit, Israel will become a witness to the world. Um, a bit of a summary. First of all, three points. Uh, the vision now contains a personal message to Zerubbabel, who was a civil leader in Israel in Zechariah's day. Zerubbabel had been pretty frustrated over the, the rebuilding of the temple or the building of the temple. The foundations had been laid in Ezra 3 verse 8, but because they had you know, problems down there, legal opposition, the building program had to be suspended. It was stopped back in Ezra 4. 23 to 24, uh, because we have, you know, some foreign enemy <coughs> opposition to the temple being rebuilt. So now 15, 15 years have now passed, uh, and the original opposition is no longer there. But you know what? Uh, Zerubbabel, he is he, frustrated because nothing's happened. They've done nothing. He's frustrated with the apathy of the people. Uh, and if you go into Haggai chapter 1, you'll see that. So what we have here is a personal message to Zerubbabel. What's it to do is to encourage him uh, in his spirit concerning the completion of the temple. It, it will be built. It's going to be built. Because what we see here is the problem is not with him. Because Zerubbabel, he wants to get going. The problem here is with the Jewish people. Second, uh, this vision deals with the restoration of the Jewish state after it is filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? This is what this, this uh, fifth vision is. Third, it's going to deal with what, uh, what, we, what, we, what uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum here says 
it's the third sign of Jonah, um, which is which is the, the, the third sign of resurrection to which Israel will respond. Um, so this, this is the background to the fifth vision in verses 1 to 14. The vision itself comes in the first three verses. And uh, verse 1, preparation of Zechariah. So now the angel that talked with me came again. So we have a new vision now. And he waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Why? Well, he woke him up because he has to prepare him to receive a new vision. And the vision itself is in verses 2 to 3. Zechariah was awake when he received these visions. Uh, and by now, he's already had four tremendous visions. You know, he'd fallen asleep. He'd fallen into a state of exhaustion. Uh, and in fact, uh, we see Daniel, same thing with Daniel in, in, uh, in his visions, in, in when he had his great visions in Daniel 8, 18, Daniel 10, 8, and Daniel 10, 9. Uh, Daniel fell asleep out of exhaustion as well. You know, the angel here had to wake him up because he's not to be given this vision in a dream. He's going to be given this vision wide awake so he can, it's like a, it's like virtual reality. He will see every bit of this vision. In a dream, he's asleep, he dreams it, but here he's awake and he, it's like seeing it in virtual reality. He, he's seeing this vision played out. And now in verse two of chapter four, what does he see? He sees a lampstand. And the question is now raised. And he said unto me, uh, this is the angel says unto to, to Zechariah, what do you see? What say you? And the answer is, behold, a candlestick. Um, it wasn't really a candlestick. Why? Because they didn't have uh, candles back then. It was a lampstand which burned oil, uh, right? It burned oil. It, was, it, wasn't, it didn't burn fat. It was made of gold and it had seven lamps. And... Uh, to understand this vision a little bit better, we need to know that the lampstand was used as a symbol for Israel. Uh, why? Because Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. We see that in Isaiah 62, verses 1 to 2. Um, so what this vision shows here is that Israel will serve as a lamp in the Messianic or the Millennial Kingdom. Now, it's also a symbol of the Messiah as a light to the Gentiles in Isaiah 42, verse 6, and Isaiah 49, verse 6. A little burst of history here. The seven-branched lampstand is called a menorah. Uh, it, uh, it first appears in the, back in the tabernacle, Moses in the tabernacle, and then it was in the first temple, Solomon's temple, and later it stood in the second temple, which is the one that they're rebuilding here. Um, and then uh, this also became the, the, the focus of the Feast of Hanukkah. Uh, but then they, they had an eight-branched lamp uh, was used instead of the seven-branched one. Um, and uh, a, a bit of a rabbinic uh, history here. Uh, according to the Jewish writings, uh, in the year AD 30, the year that Christ was uh, crucified, the middle, the middle lamp of the seven-branched lamp stand the middle lamp uh, the lamp was supposed to be kept continually burning. The middle lamp of, of the 24-hour lamp burning mysteriously ceased burning. Um, that's the Jewish writing, say that. Now, in the diaspora, the dispersion, it became a symbol of Judaism, and today it's actually in the coat of arms of the state of Israel. Now, what do we know about this lamp stand? Well, first of all, it was all of gold, and because it was made, it, it says it was made of pure gold. It had its bowl on top of it. There's, so there's a bowl on top of this lampstand. So above the seven branches, there, there's this golden bowl. And he points out that it had seven lamps thereon. So it's a seven, <clears throat> it's a, it's a lampstand with seven lamps fixed to it. <clears throat> then he noticed that there were seven pipes leading to each of the lamps. So rather than just having one bowl from the one one that pipe from the from the bowl to the lamps. There were seven pipes, so there was uh, uh, seven pipes to each individual lamp, which was on the top. Now, this made a total of forty-nine because there's seven seven lamps. Uh, each of them had seven ducts to it, 
or seven pipes to it. So there's 49 ducts, ducts or smaller pipes feeding oil from the bowl above the seven, uh, above to the seven lamps, the bowl to the seven lamps underneath it. Now, we, 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 we know, well, we know here uh, in this uh, prophecy of Zechariah that a lot of his, uh, uh, a large part of Zechariah's um, prophecy is based upon Daniel's prophecies, right? Uh, so what, what, we, what we look at here is that these uh, 49 ducks represent, you, you know, in Daniel's 77s, these 49 ducks, these seven sevens, represent the first set of seven sevens from the set of 77s of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Lots of sevens here. And most specifically in verse 25. These seven sets of seven ducks represent the 49-year period during which Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. The bowl of oil sitting above the lampstand supplies the oil to it through these 49 ducts or pipes. In verse 3, Zechariah sees two olive trees and two olive trees by it. So there are two olive trees by this lamp with the golden bowl on top. One upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof. So on each side of the bowl above the lampstand, there were two olive trees, one on each side. These two olive trees are supplying the golden bowl with oil directly. So they represent an inexhaustibly, an inexhaustible supply of oil. Now, back in the tabernacle in the temple, the supply of oil was dependent upon what was given by the people. But in this vision, it's coming directly from the source, which is the olive trees. Now, the main ingredient that is being emphasized throughout this vision is the oil. It comes from the olive trees via the two spouts and empties into the, into the golden bowl. From the golden bowl via the 49 uh, ducts, it feeds oil to the seven lamps. So the oil, this oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And this uh, we'll, we'll see shortly in verse six. So what Zechariah sees here is a lampstand representing Israel filled with oil. It's a picture of Israel as a saved nation fulfilling their calling in the messianic kingdom to be the light to the Gentiles. So here we have the seven branched lampstand. We have the two olive trees. We have the golden bowl on top, the lampstand. We have the spouts from the trees feeding oil into the golden bowl. And then we have the 49 ducks, which are feeding into the seven lamps. Single pipe feeding the oil in, seven smaller pipes feeding every single light. Altogether, 49 pipes, 49 small pipes. This, this represents Israel as a saved nation, fulfilling their calling in the millennial or messianic kingdom to be the light to the Gentiles. That's what Zechariah is seeing. Remember, uh, God says to Zechariah, Jerusalem will be rebuilt. The nations are going to come to Jerusalem and He's just now giving him a picture of what is going to be taking place. Here we see the purpose uh, of the um, encouragement uh, to Zerubbabel. Haggai, remember Haggai, uh, he, he prophesied at the same time as Zechariah. They, and, and both these guys, Haggai and Zechariah, they ministered to Joshua and Zerubbabel. Yeah. We've seen Joshua, the high priest. We just see, you know, he was just encouraged in his, in his bit. Now we have Zechariah's request for interpretation of what he's seeing here. And Zechariah says, look, I answered saying, well, what are these things I'm just looking at? His questions, it's not about the meaning of the menorah because he knows what that is. But in any case, he knows what that is, right? So what, what he sees, what he's asking here is this whole vision, I, I don't get it. And when he says these, it, it means everything here. What are the, what's all these things? He says, and he, and uh, and 
then we have the response of the angel. He says, he answered and said unto me, know you not what these are? And not, in other words, he says, don't you know what this vision is all about? Well, no, I don't know. What is it? He didn't know the purpose of, the purpose of it just yet. He, he had no idea. But he's going to be given two basic messages to the rubber belt. First, we see in verses 6 to 7. In verse 6, the angel points out the means whereby God will accomplish his program. Uh, then he spoke, saying, this is the word of Jehovah unto Zerubbabel, saying, so message for Zerubbabel, it's going to show Zerubbabel how I'm going to accomplish my purposes. He says, first of all, not by might. That means it's not going to be by physical power, nor by power, not by mental power. Third, but by my spirit. So God's work would be accomplished by spiritual power through the working of the Holy Spirit himself. So we notice, remember, we notice that oil is in abundant supply throughout every part of the vision that Zechariah was given. Oil is a biblical symbol of the Holy Spirit. And the lamps are supplied not by human hands as in the temple, or in the tabernacle, but by divine providence. So the point is this, the temple will be completed by divine power because there is an inexhaustible supply of this power since its source is eternal, the living Holy Spirit. So the establishment of Israel will be by the same means. And often, you know, Israelis say, look, just look how, look what we've done. Well, actually, it's God who has done it all. It's by my spirit. My spirit has done it all. Not by physical or mental power. It's by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, in verse 7, we're almost there. God makes the rubber bell a promise, saying that the mountain would become a plain. A uh, bit of a question. He says, who art you, O great mountain, before the rubber bell? You shall become a plain. Whenever the word mountain is used symbolically in scripture, it's always a symbol for a king, a kingdom, or a throne. And the point here is that the king who put a stop to the rebuilding of the temple will be removed, as every impediment to God's program will be removed. The king who was responsible for hindering the reconstruction work was the emperor Cambyses II, who committed suicide near Mount Carmel. And that set the stage for the new emperor, Darius fourth Hisapis to give the Jews permission to continue rebuilding the walls. So the first promise is that this mountain will become a plain, and it did. Remove that king. Second promise to Zerubbabel is he shall bring forth the top stone, the capstone. Now, when a foundation stone is laid, it marks the beginning of the construction program, right? The, the, the slabs put down. That's been laid, that was laid 15 years earlier. Putting the top stone in place marks the completion. So his point here is that just as the rubber ball was the man who laid the foundation stone 15 years earlier, so God would make sure that he also laid the top stone. And according to his, uh, uh, Ezra 3.8, as Zerubbabel did start the, construct, the reconstruction of the temple, and indeed Zerubbabel did finish it in Ezra 6, verses 14 to 15. Third, he says this will be done with the shoutings of grace, grace onto it. What does grace mean? Grace means unmerited favor. So he affirms that God will do it, and he reaffirms it, authenticating what he said in verse 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. So it's God's Holy Spirit that will do this. Now in verses 8 to 10, he gives a second message to Zerubbabel. And verse 8, we have the introduction to it. Moreover, the word of Jehovah came unto me, saying, and in verse 9, we have the promise. Zerubbabel, who laid the foundation, will also finish it as confirmed by Ezra in Ezra 6, 14. So the point is, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, so his hands will finish it. And then he shows that the fulfillment of this prophecy 
will authenticate the prophetic office of Zechariah. You shall know that Jehovah of hosts has sent me unto you. Now, anyone can go around claiming to be a prophet receiving direct revelation from God. However, a real prophet had to authenticate himself by giving a genuine near-term prophecies, near prophecies, near to when he in his lifetime, in order that his distant prophecies could also be trusted. And here we have one of those prophecies. Zerubbabel, this is a prophecy from, from uh, uh, Zechariah, Zerubbabel will complete the temple, and he did, according to Ezra. So this, uh, this confirms Zechariah as a prophet from God. In verse 10, we have a promise made to the people. For who has despised the day of small things? Foundations have not been much to look at compared to the Solomonic temple. Uh, and we, you know, if you look into Ezra 3, verses 10 to 13, and, and Haggai 2, verse 1 to 9, you will see that. But now, now he says that God has a more glorious purpose. But what we're seeing here, he says, this is just a starting point. So don't, so what he's saying is don't despise this as being insignificant. Now, as it turned out, Zerubbabel's temple was actually insignificant when compared with Solomon's temple. But later on, it was remodeled by Herod the Great and it became the Herodian temple. And this was even more magnificent than the Solomonic temple. And, and even rabbis who did not like Herod, they did say, whoever had not seen the temple he built had not seen beauty in all of his life. So even the rabbis said that about Herod's temple. So this is the temple. Herod's temple is the temple that Messiah himself would come to in. Uh, and, and, and that's according to Malachi 3 verse 1. Malachi prophesied that. Final point is that Israel will yet be glorified and become a light to the Gentiles, uh, as we see in Isaiah 60, verses 1 to 2. But Zechariah 4, this is just a starting point. Then he states, For these seven shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. The seven lamps of the seven branch lampstand will rejoice when they see. Zerubbabel picking up the hammer again because this will signal fresh movement towards completing the temple. But then he explains what these seven lamps represent. For these are the eyes of Jehovah. They these seven lamps represent the eyes of Jehovah. Now, since the number seven expresses the idea of completion, this emphasizes here that Jehovah is the all-seeing God, uh, as Zechariah 3, 9 pointed out. So these eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth. They are alert and watchful throughout the whole earth to make sure that God's purposes are fulfilled. Notice, this is done according to the to and fro motif, indicating here that angelic beings are actually the agents of those making sure these things are taking place. So it means that God himself will rejoice when Zerubbabel picks up the tools again, he gets back on the tools and he's going to complete the temple. So while this temple, uh, this Zerubbabel's temple only had some very humble beginnings, God was happy with it. Therefore, do not despise the day of small things. And that is it for today.